Yes, so here we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April monthly community call. Um, today, again, we'll be discussing the friction standard update. Um, so I've shared the notes uh, in the chat. Uh, I think we more or less all know each other, except for maybe Eduardo. So it could be still fun to do a very, very quick round of intros, um, if you don't mind. Maybe Eduardo, you can start. If you can speak. Uh, hi, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Eduardo Bejar. I'm from Fundapi, based in Ecuador. And we are interested in learning more about the, the progress of the standard. So thank you. Thanks, Eduardo, and welcome. Um, would you like to pick maybe someone to go after you? or? I can quickly go otherwise. Uh, so I'm Sarah Petty, you all know me, I think. I'm the community manager of Frictionless Data um, and I'm based in Bologna, Italy. Uh, I'll throw the ball to Pierre, who is also new. Uh, why don't you quickly introduce yourself, Pierre? Hi, everybody. I'm Pierre Camilleri from the co French Cooperative Multi and I'm the new maintainer of uh, Validata, so I'm, I'm a developer, uh, which is a tool that heavily re uh, relies on frictionless. So, hi everyone, first time here. Would you like to pick someone to go after you, Pierre, and welcome to this community? Uh, yes, uh, Eduardo. Eduardo is the only person that just went. Uh, but ah, he sorry, keeps sorry. you laughing, you can go next. Pierre <laughs> and Eduardo. So, I'm Keith, I'm a postdoc at NIH in the US. Uh, I'm about to finish up there. And I will pick. Evgeny. Yeah, thank you. I'm Evgeny. I'm based in Portugal and um, now working on the notification version two. I'll be the working group. Uh, what about you then? Dan, Dan would you like to go next? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear. Um, yeah, I'm Dan Fader. I'm in the U.S., usually in Philadelphia, but I'm uh, in New Hampshire at the moment. And um, I work for Civic Actions as a uh, government contractor uh, on the DCAN project, which is a data catalog software. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in the updates. Uh, we mostly don't, we, we have, we mostly use uh, DCAT, uh, but we have been using the table schema uh, specification for implementing data dictionaries in DCAN. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in how to make maybe the two standards more uh, interoperable or something. Um, I'll pass to Phil. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, I'm at the University of Chicago and Center for Translational Data Science. Um, and I spent my youth in New Hampshire. So, um, uh, and my particular interest is in, um, uh, well, m many, but one particular one at the moment is in the use of frictionless uh, uh, relative to um, NIH data sharing uh, requirements and standards. And uh, Kyle, I don't think you've gone yet. Yeah, I'm I'm Kyle. I'm here in the U.S. as well. I I'm living in uh, Oregon, but um, my uh, I'm I'm working at Penn State University. Um, I'm I'm also interested in frictionless for um social behavioral data like Phil. Um, I do a lot of work in education science with um, IES Institute Education Sciences uh, data. So um, I'll pass it to Jan. Yeah, I'm a. Uh... Uh, Jan van der Laan, I'm a methodologist at uh, Statistics Netherlands. Um, and we are planning to use frictionless to, to provide data sets to some of our internal users uh, uh, as a way to uh, um, yeah, make <laughs> to yeah to make it for them easier to work with the data we, we provide them. Um, and I'll pass the, uh, I think Peter is the only one that hasn't been yet. So uh, Peter. I'm based in Belgium. Um, 
I work at an institute uh, where we do standardized data and historical data standards and involved in frictionless working group. I also maintain the frictionless R package. I maintain the MPDP standard, which is based on frictionless, and trying to promote frictionless standards in the biodiversity implementation. I'll pass to Augusto. Thanks, Peter. Your audio was a bit quiet. So if you can maybe put the micro next time a little bit close to your mouth. And Augusto. Hi, everyone. I'm Augusto Herrmann. I'm lead data engineer uh, here at the sector for management and innovation. And we use a frictionless uh, framework and st standards, uh, mostly to publish open data packages to make it easier for data users. And I'm eager to find out what's going on with the next revision of data packages. I have some ideas already. Haven't been able to check out uh, if those have been addressed or not, but that's the perfect occasion. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Augusto. And yeah, again, welcome, everybody. Um, I got to say, I'm based in Brazil. <laughs> Um, I'll share again, because maybe I shared that before you joined, Pierre, uh, but we have the meeting notes just here. Um, so first thing to announce, as I just said at the beginning of the call as well, um, we are getting very, very closer to the V2 final release, and that's absolutely fantastic. We're very excited. Um, thank you so much, because, I mean, that's also thanks to all of you and all the commitment and the work that you put in this. Uh, so huge congratulations to you, first of all. Um, and then we basically saw there are just a few items left on the list for the final version, and we put a few that we wanted to discuss uh, with you uh, today. Um, so maybe we can start with um, data representation. Um, Evgeny, do you want to say something about, about that? Um, yeah, I was thinking what would be the best way uh, to discuss it because by cons I return to this uh, pull request and discussion I feel okay I need some <laughs> little bit more time you know to read in thinking so I I think maybe if uh, someone else have something to say about it maybe Kyle uh, was cu currently like blocking us uh, in general like my opinion was thinking about the because uh, the discussion for, for people who uh, were not involved was mostly about uh, uh, making more clear distinction on all the uh, data layers. In version one, it was physical and logical layer. In version two, it might be more qualified like physical layer for data than uh, native layer, than uh, logical layer. And uh, but in, practically, it was basically about what is missing values, uh, false values, and true values, uh, and how to in describe and interpret them. And in my opinion, it think it seems kind of like uh, practically we we don't really you know have a kind of like big decision there because basically like missing values used for mostly for strings. We got the really like. Uh, Kind of like occasional case uh, posted by Adam, one of the aspects authors about being able to use uh, integers as like uh, true false indicators in uh, Boolean fields for some kind of uh, uh, conversion if it's needed, maybe for, for some systems. But in general, for me, it feels like uh, it's still like not a big thing, and we might be. You might be you know getting too much into like details compared to how it affects users i think basically not really uh, a lot but uh, again I, I then i like read uh, kyle's categorical uh, data type proposal and just yeah i feel like i need to think like a little bit more just what edge cases etc etc so i'll just pass maybe to someone who have a stronger opinion on it but one thing uh, what, what i think that in general what we anyway i think we, we need to do just you know to clarify the way uh, uh data representation was written in version one because 
in my opinion, it's kind of like it's it's not really like correct calling like physical values uh, like uh, something that is uh, like already like something in computational environments instead of like on on the disk, and like even like it's not uh, that changed, but still some qualification better like description on the table scheme is still it will be still good even though we don't you know change missing values. I don't really, I don't have a really strong opinion if, if missing values needs to be, you know, only strings, including like integers or whatever. I, I don't think it's like super important based on like feedback for like 10 years. We, we didn't hear a lot about, please add like objects to be like uh, missing values, right? Because it's usually about strings. Um, so yeah, this Kate. If go ahead, you have your hand raised. Hey, thanks. So I actually don't have anything to say on this particular issue, but I just wanted to bring up a kind of related topic um, that we can either come back to, yeah, maybe come back to discuss, which is, it seems like we're deciding on a lot of things where we're really not sure how it's going to play out in the long run. We're trying to predict kind of what the use cases will be for edge cases and things like that. And that's really hard to do in my experience. And sometimes you just have to try things and see what works and a good idea ends up being not so great and adds complexity and you want to get rid of it and so on. Right now, my sense is that the community leans towards a conservative approach where once we add something, we try to make it there forever because we don't want to like break things in the future, which makes sense. But I wonder if we, as we're making these kind of revisions, maybe we could have both a provisional feature uh, phase and a deprecation process formally. So we can start to try things out and say, hey, this is here. We might get rid of it in a year. We're going to decide, but we're going to try this out for a while. And then if it becomes really good, we switch it from provisional to in the standard, and then it's going to be always kind of supported. Um, and then similarly, like starting to think about the deprecation process and how we can remove some ideas that were kind of built in early on and maybe not as helpful in the future um, and add complexity that we don't need. That's all. Whoops. But I forget to go ahead. That was taking notes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so actually, I think uh, the initial agenda for this meeting was like discussing versioning, etc. But we suddenly kind of like achieved this <laughs> just without the call, just uh, on the GitHub, which I think is great use, and it uh, simplifies a lot what uh, Kit mentioned regarding deprecation uh, release cycle. Uh, so now we have. Uh, Basically, proper versioning on the metadata, and with new with the new edition, it also solved really uh, kind of like old problem when, for example, you reference uh, table schemas, which is a, a separate document, and uh, you need to re reference the reference all this stuff. Uh, Peter uh, must understand me because it's it was really like weird thing, uh, complex thing on the implementation level, and currently uh, with the new edition, basically. Uh, uh, published table schemas and table dialects can be basically independent, so they can be versioned, for example, using another version of the uh, standard, and it will still work through the validation, even though like data package is already like on the like third or like fifth version. So because validation now is uh, 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 has boundaries uh, uh, similar to JSON schema like a document uh, like root level document, so. And uh, it, I think, opens uh, a lot of uh, possibilities be, uh, being like, yeah, as we discussed it previously, uh, more uh, brave regarding uh, futures changes. And for example, uh, for the whole version two, uh, version two work, uh, my main, main concern currently regarding this like array list stuff, and my uh, feeling that at some point maybe we will merge like list and array into one thing, maybe like because we don't know what 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 will what will be like real uh, use cases, right? For it, it's not yet clear. And uh, I think it's a good example as well when we can you know move faster because of proper versioning. Kyle. Um, I guess I'll I'll jump in because I've been the most um, vocal um, about the 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 native values physical values. Um, 
my my broad um sense is um that um the the original i mean and correct me if i'm wrong here but the the fr frictionless comes from um from a um a, a standpoint of of describing textual data so textual delimited data like csv and stuff um and that's how the physical value definition is is designed in the schema um so that's why missing values in the in version 1.0 are um are strings that's why true false values are strings because these lexically um match to the the values that are coming from a csv um and but since then there's been a lot of use of the the frictionless standard to describe things like sql um uh tables um excel open document um you know many many different formats um and um i would say this this works this works for when we're looking at primitive data types going through like uh numbers strings and um stuff like that but then we start getting these edge cases coming up when we have um, t uh, more rich types, like um, I'd say a Boolean is one of those that can be represented by strings or or ints in a um, in a particular format. Um, and so then the way things are currently defined, um, <clears throat> when we can't assume that our data is coming from string, then there's these conversions that start having to take place behind the, the scenes. Um, and, um, you know, as Keith was, was talking about, there's some long-term, um, uh, depending on the future types we're wanting to support, like categorical or other potential things that have diverse, um, diverse ways of being supported in different, um, uh, in different formats. Um, I think there's some, some edge cases and amb ambiguity we're potentially going to be running into. Um, I think the the example I put there with the the boolean values and and that I think Ethan was was showing um uh is is one of them um I would say for yes for for most of the use cases for like um uh for these um for for primitive data types it 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 is is well described but um like I said for these other um uh for for these other types of metadata and these other types of types that we may, I mean, that, that we're wanting to describe right now. And then we're also going to potentially want to describe in the future. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about it. I feel like it's sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's something that's, that's sort of been jerry rigged onto the frictionless standard. And, and yes, it is what we're currently doing now. And I agree that like it should be described somewhere, but I'm a little bit concerned for it to become a part of the standard itself. I feel like there's, there's a deeper abstraction that we're missing. There's a, there's a better way of, of dealing with these, these different formats that can have different features that can have different, um, all these diverse ways of coming from them, um, that, that we're sort of missing on here. And so, um, uh, that that's kind of where I where I stand, but you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm I'm supportive of whatever the community decides. Thank you, Kyle. And I was I saw that you have your hand raised, but I just wanted maybe to give quickly uh, an opportunity to Evgeny if you wanted to reply to that. Um, yeah, just a quick one. Um, yeah, so um, just a few uh, random uh, thoughts I wanted to share that. First of all, I think that's here's kind of like uh, because um, we're trying to do a practical standard, right? And uh, we just mm, define different like table dialect, table schema, uh, different specifications, but actually they kind of they don't live on the same like level of abstraction. So, for example, basically the whole table it's answering Kyle's comments on uh, on. On the pull request, uh, uh, like the whole table schema basically is uh, meant to be like on the logical level of abstraction, right? Like fields, uh, types, like uh, like in a like perfect world. Uh, but basically, what we have also in the table schema is like missing values. Uh, they basically just no. It's it's not like a logical level. It's if it were like like perfectionist 
specification, they would live in like table dialect or something because it's a how to parse data. It's uh, it's not about like table schema. It's 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 other level. So uh, that might be one of uh, you know of problems when we try to for formulate uh, things because um, we need to kind of like uh, balance between uh, practical things and uh, like good abstractions. I, I feel the same. Like for example, dialect has had a has a header, and header it's a logical thing. It's it's not about parsing CSV, right? So. I think we need just you know to uh, balance here. I, I actually, uh, as, as the same as Kyle, I, I don't you know completely sure what the right thing to do regarding uh, uh, this uh, data representation. But I feel more like that things like missing values is not a problem at all. I'm more concerned about categorical because uh, it's it's already kind of like mixed logical. Uh, in other levels, uh, so I don't I don't think like missing values or true values is a, like a problem for us. We we can keep with them strings, and it's you know it won't it won't affect basically I think anything. But categorical is yeah is is more important I think. Um, yeah, sorry, Augusto. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Yevgeny, but I actually wanted to address a completely different subject. So if Kai wants to add something to that, so I can go with it later. Yeah, thanks, Agus. So, Kyle, is there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to um, respond to what Evgeny said. I'm, I'm totally in agreement what, with what you're saying there, that the ideal would be to, um, to, to, to have a clear separation from you know, what is um, to, to, to separate the conversion into logical values um, more clearly from the conversion from native values or from um, uh, physical values as, as spoken in the original spec. Um, and so I, um, you know, but I, I think the, the missing values, I agree, it's not a, it's not a, a, a pressing problem right now for me it's just representative of a type of problem that i think will um be you know that 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 is a present problem with the the categorical proposal um but is representative of this category of 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 type of problems that that we'll potentially be running into as we're considering other types Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So I was so you. I know that you want to change topics. So if anyone else, and I'm assuming Evgeny, but maybe also Phil, want to respond to this conversation, just jump in, and I will still keep you in the loop. And <laughs> yeah, I, th th this was on on this topic that we're talking about. Um, uh, I mean, this this could be the wrong way to think about it, but but for me at least, I see a a real difference between um, properties that that only refer to the logical value. And so for me, for example, the constraints are of that type where, where it makes sense. You're only ever, it only makes sense to refer to things once they've been cast mm -hmm. to the type that is specified in the schema, as opposed to um, missing values and also um, mm -hmm. true false, for example, where, where what those are is providing guidance for how the casting to the, to the target type should be done, right? That's basically what those things do. Um, and so I guess I do feel like this is like, like there was some ambiguity before that some of us ran into, and we often ran into it because we were feeding in data from different sources and trying to use the same schema. So bringing, you know, you're reading a CSV file or you're reading a data frame that, you know, a pandas data frame contains the same thing, but clearly, you know, there was an issue there. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to clean up for sure some of that ambiguity. I'm not sure we need to make radical changes necessarily to do that. Um, so that, for example, I'm not sure I would be perfectly happy with keeping the missing values and the um, true false such that, you know, the string one is not equivalent to the integer one, because that allows you to be very explicit about how the casting to whatever the type is that you're headed to is done. And I agree, it's a little awkward, perhaps, to, to have those in there. Um, but it's explicit, which I kind of appreciate in this case. So, um, 
so I, I guess for, for me, at least a, a big part of this, uh, I, I agree with virtually everything that's been said. Um, I don't think we've had great discussion. I'm not sure that the implications of that necessarily involve major changes. They just involve really the way we describe the behavior. So I don't think we're looking at necessarily at major changes here. There have been a couple of things that have been proposed that are major, but um, but as I said, I think for a lot of users, distinguishing between instructions to the casting process versus you know things that are then applied once the target type is achieved, I think making that distinction could be helpful. Um, and the one thing I would just note too, and I, I could be wrong about this, uh, Evgeny, um, but um, uh, for missing values at the moment, right? you can specify strings, but for example, if you're coming from a data frame and you've got a null value in there, um, you can also put in a, you know, a, an, an NAN or something that refers to the native null type. That may be an error that that's true, but at the moment you actually can specify that as, as a missing value. Um, so, at least for friction spy, it just checks for so missing value will be a missing value if it's in Python, it's a text value, and it's a match uh, one of the array missing values array items. So and if it's a null already, it's kind of like native type, it's new terminology, and it just pass was as like any for example uh, value for the any any type any field type. And just, I'm really sorry to, to Augusto, but just super quick uh, point that uh, uh, regarding uh, native types, why I think it might be still a good idea, because when I was thinking about it, we basically saw Kyle meant that it can be, could be, you know, kind of like table schema for CSV, for Excel, etc. But when I was thinking about it, there is, uh, actually, I think there is no like Excel, you know, data types. There is Excel data types in every existing like uh, environment, like R, Python, Pandas, Powers. It's uh, so basically we're dealing basically with a kind of like matrix of formats, environments, and uh, it's everywhere things can be different. So Excel number can be like. Um, some kind of fault in C or just number in JavaScript. So that seems why basically we can define on this level, we, we can just, you know, have this table schema, EGL representation, logical values that the implementation, you know, can try to at least, you know, uh, get calls to from there, what they get in like every, from every format on every like uh, computing environment. So that was my thinking. And uh, yeah, I'll pass to uh, Jan. Uh, yeah, I want to react to what, uh, what Phil said. I think uh, I completely agree with that. But I also think, especially for, for missing values, I think you run into the, there are two levels of missing values, I think. One is the physical, for example, if you write a data frame in R to, to, to CSV, the default writer will, will write a text NA uh, to indicate missing values. I, I, I think that that's that's a physical thing that, that belongs to, 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 to an R CSV file. Uh, but at the same time, if you read in a file, that might also indicate, you might, might also want to indicate that the value of nine uh, corresponds to a missing value. And I think that, that that's on a, on, a, on a logical level. Uh, um, and I think we we already have a missing values field at a data resource level. I think that that that, that would make sense to use it for for physical uh, types of missing values. But if you the the missing values at at field level, I think it would make more sense to have those at the logical level, maybe. But uh, yeah. Thanks, Jan. Um, is there anything else to add to this particular item? Otherwise, I can finally leave the floor to August, who's been waiting for <laughs> minutes. It's okay. I wanted to ask about a particular pattern that we have had for quite a while. 
which is language support. Uh, and at least how I interpret this uh, pattern. No, I, by the way, I have also searched uh, GitHub and if that was already an issue on that. But I don't think this has been part of the discussion on uh, the next version of the package or table schema. But uh, speaking on uh, the way that the pattern is described, uh, there is a, a way to, to add multi-language support for descriptions and titles from packages, resources, and fields. However, um, it seems like when you have um, a column on multiple languages, at least I can get that impression from the examples, that you must necessarily have uh, one column for each language. And maybe you don't want that because maybe you have a column that is numerical or categorical or uh, Boolean or anything else that's not language related. And you don't want to repeat the column. You want to have the column only once in the table but still, you want to have uh, the field, the metadata about the, the field of the, the column with the title and the description in two or more languages. And I don't see a way to do that unless we, you, we, you also repeat the column <laughs> like a numerical column one time for each language that you have. Uh, so. I don't know if it's just a question of updating the pattern or uh, maybe we should discuss that in the context of the next version of table scheme. Uh, by the way, uh, I have been using a pattern that I have already shared with the community, but not really documented it in that what we do is we have only one CSV file and we have several data package descriptions and we'll name it like so, table.n.json for uh, everything in English, table.pt.json for everything in Portuguese, everything I mean, the metadata, the title and description, the data is the same. We don't translate data, most data would probably never be translated because that's so much variation and unfeasible in many cases to translate the data, but the metadata we can translate and we do that. However, uh, the current way we do that in order to publish open data sets with those two uh, parallel data package descriptions, descriptors, is internally we have a YAML file for the data description part like uh, column types, data validation, missing values, et cetera, et cetera. And another separate file for each language, just for the titles and descriptions of tables, columns. And we have a Python script that merges all that and produces the two files because otherwise we have, if we had to, uh, to maintain two parallel files, that's not, a, it, it, we could risk like, when we evolved the, 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 the schema, we forgot to uh, make the same change, change to every uh, data package descriptor, like we change a type or add a column. And so keeping that in sync is not so easy. So that's the solution we, we arrived at is just that we will read the data descriptor, the, the, the data uh, type uh, and descriptor, and then we lead read the, the labels uh, from the respective languages and produce the, the, the package, final data package. Evgeny? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, great point. And uh, like, uh, uh, as you said, uh, Gusto, you like weren't uh, really around the latest update because you, you're busy. Uh, so 
just uh, I think what we do now is uh, just basically uh, catching up with the kind of like technical depth for the specs for the last five years. And I see that going forward and especially after currently working on different uh, like Sik and Zinodo and other like uh, integrations for data package, I, I just learned more about other uh, metadata systems like uh, the data side, uh, like others. Uh, like for example, there is a archival mechanism for uh, harvesting or O I. Yeah, I'll, I'll type it, but you probably know this one. Um, and uh, I think that uh, going forward, we have uh, really good, interesting uh, points. We can uh, continue because currently it's just we were just you know fixing stuff and doing small things like fixing data representation. And I think language support one thing like data catalogs. Uh, can be also really helpful if we, you know, think about of that the package as a data API, for example, for, I just finished a, a new plugin for CCAN. And if, for example, it's a, that the package extended to be, the, uh, has a specification for data catalog, like more, 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 more or kind of like refined than we have now in pat patterns. It also kind of like huge um, cron for, uh, for like data package uh, to work on and uh, like, also, if you just take a look on data side metadata, we can find like other useful things we we can uh, evolve in the data package and languages. I think it's already well done in like other metadata systems like Zenodo data side, and we can just uh, probably build on top of them rather than on our uh, pattern or like mix solution, but probably I think it, it will be better, you know, to just to stick maybe to data side approach because it's kind of feels to be really standard in many systems. But uh, the, the bottom line that uh, I think that's just what will be after version two and probably as, you know, version 2.1, version 2.2, just adding these like most pressing uh, things. Thanks, Evgeny. Uh, my wish was just to avoid repetition as much as possible in multi-language data sets. So, thanks. Thank you, Augusto. Um, moving on. Um, so the other thing that I we had uh, on the agenda today was to have a short retrospective about versioning. So this call in principle was supposed to be a discussion about versioning, but that got sold uh, meanwhile before uh, before we reached the call. But we wanted to maybe have an opportunity to have a little retrospective or a little discussion about that. Um, Evgeny, do you want to get started or Peter maybe? Yeah, I have nothing to summarize on the versioning. I'm just curious, given that we've introduced a couple of new things in version two, to really release a version two release candidate one for a, quite a long time, like up until the end of this year. So we can actually test things and implement things. And then if we notice, oh, things should actually change, then maybe release a release candidate two to not be too fast with the official version too, but like have release candidates that we can test um, before we come out with the official version too. Yeah, thanks Peter for the comment. Um... Uh, I'm sure if it's if it's possible regarding the like uh, funding requirements for this one, but I think it's in my opinion it's not so important how we like call things, but it's more important, for example, to discuss this uh, new versioning thing regarding regarding immutability. It's uh, added to the list because uh, so currently we're trying to uh, have immutable versions, may, meaning that uh, immutable like. Uh, uh, JSON schemas for every data package version. And uh, so what Peter, you, you said, like, uh, let's say like 
there is a version two, but for example, I think it's not important if it's like version two, like release candidate or version two, and then it will be like a few fixed releases. But if we stick to immutable uh, metadata, we won't be able to kind of like uh, implicitly uh, do some like JSON schema fixes, even there is a kind of like a really stupid bug somewhere and people already uh, put a uh, link to the version two profile, for example. So I, I really like immutable things because it can be cached on implementations. It's like really simple, nice, but I'm just curious if uh, if if it's has like these cons of not being able to fix things. Because uh, yeah, as, as I said, like I think like if we still need uh, Sarah, probably we'll like maybe we'll, we'll figure out it like in this month. If we still need to call it like version two, like final list, because it's like grant requirement for this project, it's it's not so important. But uh, it's, it it will be more important to be able to fix things, like for example, to the till the end of the year, if if, if something. Yeah, I think as you were saying, Evgeny. I mean the. Um... So the grant that we got is from NGI and they are pretty reasonable, I think, in the way that they're pretty accommodating also the kind of work that we need to do. So we'll need to check with them first, of course, whether we can kind of like call it not really final release, but like having some sort of like buffer time uh, to fine tune things. In principle, it should be all right, but we need to check with them first. And I can probably see if this is possible before the next call. So I can update you everyone on this. Any things like what can needs to be fixed, like uh, some bug fix or something. For example, I run now working on seek and as you know, the mappers that for uh data package had this like created property, which uh is kind of like tied to be uh one time zone with the uh sorry, time uh, date time is time zone and uh I'm going to create an issue about it, but it seems to be kind of like it's basically not a real case for not applicable for many systems. They just don't have uh, like time zone information, but uh, it breaks validation. So these kind of small changes. But uh, yeah, I think we will just discuss it on uh, GitHub if we still can yeah, stick to this immutability thing. Can you clarify what the timeline is for the funding and what timeline we envision for moving it forward? I'm, I'm trying to write something here in the chat, how I see a timeline, but yeah, I want to make sure if it aligns with uh, what the requirements are for the funding too. Yeah, uh, so again, I jump in whenever I'm missing something, but like for now, the timeline that we have, uh, the funding that we got uh, for this NGI grant is until the end of June. So in principle, the release should happen in June at some point. Um, again, they are pretty flexible, so we can have a conversation with them to see if we can have some more buffer time, not calling it the final final. Um, we can find some some wording that would work. Um, yeah, so I think this is more or less the, the timeline. And in terms of things that we need to achieve, it would be um, the V2 release, uh, the small metadata map, on which Evgeny has been working, and then some integrations with um, data publishing platforms, which is also one thing that we have um, in the agenda today. Do you feel that you need to add anything, Evgeny, to this? Um, yes, yeah, so basically, we kind of like ending this uh, iteration funded by NLNet uh, by June, and since then, we're just starting with, with new governance and like anything else we need to work on uh like from from july i guess okay so i'm not sure about phil's question in the chat about how ready the various implementation are to upgrade i think it will very much depend on the implementation i guess i think evgeny can tell you a little bit about the python framework Yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so basically um, just uh, like the reality that uh, what we do, we release uh, like standard and uh, implementation just need to catch up. We don't have a 
resources you know to to be in sync here and uh, at least i think what what the good thing what we were doing that uh, we don't do breaking changes we are kind of like uh, incrementally like in, in, improve aging futures and uh, uh, so it means that uh, except for new futures current implementations just will work for in you know, like some new uh schema based uh futures from the version two but um i think it will be discussion like in the next calls about uh software implementation but uh, historically uh, the project was uh was always like evolving this way just standard uh was released and then implementations uh were catching up Thanks, Evgeny. Peter, you wanted to add something. Yeah, Evgeny, what is your goal for having a first release candidate? How many more pull requests or features do you want to tackle? What's on the roadmap still? Um, because I mentioned in the chat, I think it's also going to be really useful to have the completely rendered website and then have like three weeks where people can just review the website because there's some I mean, stylistic choices and inconsistencies and also really reviewing the whole documentation to make sure it actually makes sense as a whole because we've tackled each individual pro um, problem. I think we need to foresee time for that before June, which is soon. So yeah, I'm curious what else you want to include um, other than the open pull requests. Um, so I think uh, basically, Real changes uh, only the pull requests we have if we can agree on them at least a part of them. Uh, there are also uh, the work up here and uh, validate uh, would like to include regarding table schema metadata. Uh, so it, it basically uh, I think it's kind of like the last proposal we will get uh, this week or next week, and I have a list like internally on my. For small things, I was going to uh, fix, update, and um, like this year, this created package created. Probably, I need to yeah, uh, I need to go through the uh, uh, watching. Uh, but uh, in general, I think that's that's it currently, uh, high level. And uh, we already got this uh, feedback from N NLNet. Uh, they tried to read about table schema, and they. I uh, found out that there is a like profile link, but it wasn't clear that uh, like when this profile needs to be you know up applied. So 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 it was like yeah. Uh, so they also suggested you know to go through uh, full review, and I'll be doing so as well, just reading the whole site uh, from like top to to the bottom. So we will encourage like everyone to do so, and basically the. Real final, uh, the real release date. I think it's uh, mostly on Open Knowledge Foundation. If they can, like, um, uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of like the the hard deadline by the NLNet uh, grant is, I think, more in July even, like probably. So it's uh, kind of like for Open Knowledge Foundation to see if there is uh, more time, you know, for this because it's it, it's uh, we can you know postpone only like small deliverable. Which is uh, revising uh, the final standard, while everything else uh, will be already done. But yeah, I think we can discuss it like next, next, next call. Yeah, and I really like the idea of having maybe a sprint at some point in June if we can find a suitable date for everyone to go through the guide, the um, website, and all the documentations and guides. I think that could be really nice. Um, I want to be mindful of Keith. Do you wanted to say something? Go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just thought I'd latch on real quick. I would just say for that kind of review, it would be great if we could try to recruit some people from the outside who would be able to give us an unbiased kind of perspective. And because all of us have some experience with this, and so it's going to be really hard to see what a novice would see. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's something that we did for the Python framework uh, in the past, and it worked quite well, like bringing in people that were not used and were looking at things with fresh eyes and really could see things that we couldn't see because we were so much into it. Yeah. 
great. Um, yes, Peter, I will work on this. Um, I'll, I'll include it in the blog uh, summary that I will publish of this course. Um, okay, so moving on, there's a couple of more things, and I don't know if we can tackle them all today, but one thing that we wanted to check with all of you is about the standards authors, and basically who wants to be listed as an author of the standard, and also shall we have a system in which is based on the GitHub commit, so do you have other ideas about this? Yeah, so currently, uh, as authors, uh, listed people, who were initially authors of previous versions. And uh, once I was able to indicate from uh, GitHub commits, but obviously GitHub commits are not like full complete uh, source of truth. So I was thinking we just, you know, um, people who just, you know, feels uh, a part of outer group just, uh, you know, tell us or pull request their names to corresponding uh, specifications because uh, obviously it's it's not reflected on GitHub. Uh, also, I think like, for example, Peter uh, mentioned kind of like camera trap uh, data package extension authored by a camera trap working group, but uh, probably in our case, because already like individuals listed here, we, we can say like uh, data package working group, we still I think need to uh, kind of like acknowledge uh, like, uh, individual contributors. Any comments on that? Okay, so let's include a working group as a, as, as a culture. And uh, if someone wants to be also listed individually, just pull request to let us know. Oh, yes. Can I just ask, as long as we're on the issue of release and, and authorship, are have you thought about a publication to go along with version two? Um, That's a nice idea. I don't think we thought about it. Maybe you thought about it, Evgeny. I didn't. <laughs> but it would um, definitely be something nice. Evgeny, yes. Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe if someone wants want to do a publication, because usually in our practice, we think uh, kind of like a conference uh, talk. It is not, we are not, you know, scientists. <laughs> so so it will be, I think, really amazing if there is a publication. Sarah already had a talk on postdem actually about like gathering this like amazing working group so yes you i was just gonna say part, part of the reason i suggested it um is is that you know for those of us trying to um increase adoption in scientific areas uh it would be really helpful if we had this and i think this would provide a very nice uh way to um you know just to kind of pull together this would be a good time to do it given that we've all spent a lot of time thinking about the, the specs and the standard. Yeah, I'd be really interested in contributing to that. Keith, did you want to add anything to that? I was just going to say, Phil, I was going to reach out to you anyway, but I've been starting to think about some kind of biology-specific extensions to the spec to build on, build on to the kind of profile aspect. And I've done this a bit in the past, and I'm kind of updating my thinking. So... If you're interested, we could start to work on that together, and that could also be folded into a paper. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, we have one minute left, so... Um... 
just to there's a bunch of other stuff that we wanted to discuss that I think we'll need to uh, move to the next call. Um, Evgeny, there's a couple of them I don't even know what exactly they uh, refer to. Um, so I don't know. I left. I leave it to you to pick one of the three uh, to quickly discuss. Can you just remind me because it was killing my laptop. It's uh, Google Docs. Is it not to the right? I see can all together. One computer. Uh, so what's what what was the. Uh, I think we're still anyway out of time. So yes. it's, it's safe to discuss it like next call. One of them was about uh, custom properties naming, but it's still quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'll put these points uh, for the next uh, the next call uh, that we can discuss. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank everybody for joining the call today. Uh, as usual, it's usually it's great to speak to you. Oh, it's great to hear all this fantastic thing, and it's really exciting to see the version two really coming uh, coming closer. Um, I would be happy to support in any way that I can this publication effort, but I don't know exactly how I could do. But if there's something that I can do, just let me know. And for the rest, uh, the next community call is going to be on the 30th of May. Um, and I'll get back with a bunch of stuff that I promised you also a timeline. Um, then if we can have that buffer period and yeah, and all of that. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good rest of the day and I'll speak to you in a month. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.